Thank you, Dan. Well, our scripture lesson today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. Hear the word of God. For Christ's love compels us, because we are all convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. <clears throat> Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. This is the word of the Lord. Today, I want to talk about the new you. <clears throat> now, 10 hours ago, over a billion people watched the ball drop in New York City's Times Square. Anybody here watch the, okay? You're part of the billion, okay? You know, back in 1907, they dropped the first iron and wood ball, and it was adorned with 125 watt lights. It was five foot in diameter, it weighed 700 pounds. Over the years, uh, this Times Square ball has gone through four redesigns, and the most recent was created in the year 2000 for the millennial celebration. It's a geodesic sphere. It has, it's six feet in diameter. It weighs 1,070 pounds, and it's covered in 504 crystal triangles, all in varying sizes. And each of these triangles has a specific designation. One's the hope for fellowship. One's the hope for peace. One's the hope for wisdom, for unity, for courage, for healing. You know what the ball's called? The star of hope. Now, why would we call the New Year's ball the star of hope? Because each new year is a time for hope. It's a time for opportunity. It's a time for us to grasp our future and destiny. I guess the question of the morning is, is, are you hoping for anything new this new year? Because there's two ways of going about it. You can wish upon a star, like the star of hope with little triangles on the, the ball, a nice sentiments, but they're not grounded upon any substantive promises. Or you can intentionally engage the presence and power of God and become the new you. And let me clarify, you're supposed to become the new person. This is God's desire for you, that you're no longer sin-dominated or self-oriented. It's the expectation when you step in to Christianity that the new you will evolve. And 2 Corinthians 5 indicates that we are a new creation, the old things pass away. And the idea of, uh, of dying to the self, it, it means handing over our bad habits, our, our, our old ways of thinking and behaving and worrying about things and the way we do relationships. The old self should no longer hold power over you. Dying to Christ means that sin doesn't have to derail your lives anymore. And here's the problem. The old self doesn't go down without a fight. Oswald Chambers talks about the hell of self-renunciation. And it is a challenge to be done with the old ways. It's the battle between my will and thy will. And how many of us are used to the Romans 7 passage, I do the things I do not want to do, I don't do the things I want to do. And after trying and failing so many times, you start to feel dead inside. You know, back in 1942, there was a fire at the Coconut Grove nightclub in Boston. Just about 500 people lost their lives. And everybody was taken to the local hospitals and were overwhelmed. And, well, <clears throat> this one doctor looked at this guy, kind of checked him out, pronounced him dead. Cover him, told the nurse. Well, the pronounced dead man said, I'm not dead. <laughs> After the nurse got up from fainting, 
The doctor treated his wounds, and he recovered. And I tell you this story because while you might feel frustrated, overwhelmed, and defeated, feeling spiritually dead, if you're still breathing, then you're not dead yet. And there's a future and a hope that God has in store for you. I do find it interesting how many people have pronounced God dead over the years. Uh, you know, Nietzsche, God is dead. You know, he's that famous German philosopher. And, and, and when you trace his replacement for a God-developed person, the Aryan man, well, guess who grabbed a hold of that concept? The Nazis. And you can see the fruit of his philosophy. You move God out, and everything falls to evil. And, and, and it is kind of sad. <clears throat> Many people assume Jesus is dead, that he never rose from the grave. He never ascended into heaven. They don't believe he's alive, far less able to help us in our trials and struggles today. And, and I'd like to argue that today's atheist really doesn't understand what Christianity is all about. You see, it's about Christ's living spirit within us. It's not rules and restrictions to control the sinful nature. No, as we read, the love of Christ controls us. And that only happens when you and I surrender and say, okay, I'm going to forgive that person that I said I'd never forgive. I'm going to start helping the poor, even if it's costly to my schedule and, and, and budget. I'm going to read arrange the trajectory of my life so Jesus is at the center of it. It's only then that, that Christianity becomes alive and a different lifestyle takes form. And, and I know people are used to saying, well, God has given us a mind and he expects us to use it. Well, yes and no. Yes, he's given us a mind. Yes, he expects us to use it. But this mind has been tainted by sin. And therefore, you and I need to live in dependency upon Him. And, and when we try to do life on our own, that's when we get lost. <clears throat> I mean, what's the purpose of wealth if you don't know how to spend it? What's the value of power if you don't know how to exercise it? What's the use of having a position of influence if you don't know how to use it? And, and yet people, they strive for power and wealth and influence, thinking that'll make me happy but they lack something important, how God wants you to live your life. And most of us have that question, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? And friends, the answer is in James 1.5. If anybody lacks wisdom, ask God who gives generously to, to all, and it will be given to them. That's a straightforward promise. You want to know what his will is for your life? You want his wisdom? Ask, and it will be given to you. And here's the dilemma of our society. We have so many different outlets for information and knowledge, and the values of the world, they contradict God's values. <clears throat> I mean, let's talk about some of the ways the world tells us to operate. Look before you leap, but then again, he who hesitates is lost. Okay? Many hands make light work, but too many cooks and spoil the broth. Uh, clothes make the man, but then again, we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Better to be safe than sorry. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. But then again, don't beat a dead horse. <laughs> if you lie down with dogs, you get fleas. But if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> I'm so confused. And, and here's the deal. The difference between human wisdom and God's is, is humans, we base our decisions on what we experience and what we observe. But when you bring God into the equation, he sees what we don't see. I like the way it's described in Hebrews 4.12 where he can separate the difference between the soul and the spirit, the marrow and the bone, the intentions of the heart. See, God goes all the way down and knows what we don't. Then he brings that guidance to us. You know, <clears throat> I prayed hard over the Christmas season, and it was a fantastic season. But I couldn't help but wonder how many people missed Jesus when they, and walked right past the gifts that God offered. 
You remember that story about the young man who was in jeans and a baseball cap and he took his violin down to the subway, opens it up, you know, puts this case down in case anybody wants to give him some tips and it's about 7.51 Friday morning and for the next 45 minutes he plays his violin. He plays six great classical pieces and during that time 1,097 people passed by. Now, what nobody knew was this violinist was the Josh Bell, the great world-leading classical musician who fills concert halls, okay? That morning, he played one of the most valuable violins ever made, a Stradivarius valued at $3.5 million. And the train station provided great acoustics. It filled the subway with, with, with music. And during that time, seven people stopped to listen to him for about a minute. Uh, 27 people gave money. Um, he's used to getting $1,000 a minute at his concerts. So th this morning, he received $32.17. At the end of his, each piece, there was no applause, just silent indifference. The master musician ignored. And people walked past this musical glory without it giving it a second glance, except for one postal worker who, when he was a kid, he used to play the violin and he recognized the talent. And then there was this one particular woman who was at a recent concert of his, and so she put herself right smack in the middle and, and absorbed all this incredible music. But friends, this is kind of what God did at Christmas. The heavenly choir making his salvation music accessible to all the people especially the lowly and, and the least. I mean, how many people approach Christmas this season hoping to obtain a warm, fuzzy feeling when there is power, radical power, available? And, and I don't think people appreciate the depth of transformation of the Lord does within us. You know, when Jesus would heal a man's eyesight, neurologists will tell us that the, the man received a double miracle. Not only did Jesus fix his optic condition, but he also installed into the man's brain the mental ability which allowed the man to make sense of the information coming through his eyes. You see, we don't realize it, but the ability to see is one part physical, the other part mental. And that's why blind people who undergo surgery, they don't automatically become seeing people. No, they still have to mentally learn how to interpret the data coming through their eyes. So when Jesus heals somebody, he's working on the outside and he's working on the inside. And, and I like this. Kind of reminds you of Psalm 139. You know my inward parts. See, Jesus knows what it takes to heal you. Well, let's get back to New Year's resolutions. Benjamin Franklin said, be at war with your vices, be at peace with your neighbors, and let every new year find you a better person. And I would like to add a better Christian. So how do we do this? Well, in one sense, it's like the old saint who said, pray as if it all depends on you, and work as if it all depends on God. Or turn that around. Pray as if it all depends on God. Work as if it all depends on you. No, I didn't stay up late and party last night, okay? <laughs> In other words, transformation requires intentionality. Okay? It, it, it actually takes prolonged effort. For you to become that person you want to be, that God wants you to be, it's not easy. A Rubel Shelley once observed, you can't build a championship team in a day. No single sales meeting can transform a company into a success. No weekend marriage or parenting seminar can completely heal a struggling family. You can't make a success of life by looking for easy fixes. Okay? You want to grow spiritually? You want to transform your life? You want to become who Jesus calls you to be? Well, it takes some serious effort. And I like what Buckmeister Fuller says. This is actually a real person, okay? I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> How would you like to be Buckmeister? You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, 
build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this is powerful. Because too often when we want to make a change, we deal with who we are and, and try to make adjustments. Do a little behavior modification. But then when something comes at us that we're not expecting, the old nature immediately responds. So rather than rolling up your sleeves and trying to do mind over matter and make it happen on your own strength, why don't you invite the Spirit of Jesus Christ to take over your mind? This is how you transform. Holy Spirit, guide me as you go forward into your every day. You know, one man commented, every once in a while somebody barks at me and my New Year's resolution is to not bark back. Okay? It's going to be a new attitude. A one woman lost 250 pounds. I said, what's your secret? She said, I quit eating things I liked. <laughs> the self-denial resulted in a new woman. I was reading about marriage. Uh, there's a marriage block that I get once a month. And it suggests that we intentionally change something in our routines, our conversations, our attitudes. And, and don't respond to everything that your partner says. This one man said, honey, can you help me find something? And she said under her breath, I'm not your seeing eye dog. Okay? The fight is right there to be had. <laughs> How about instead, okay, you laugh about it. You play with the comment. You make a joke about I'm getting older and I seem to be losing everything. Okay? Take some of the pressure <clears throat> out of the relationship and enjoy life instead. Another component for a good marriage, forgive and forgive again. And set goals that require working together to achieve. If you do your thing and, 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 and she does her thing, you're not on the same page. And, and by the way, you are each other's main witness to life. Okay? It's billions of people. It's been 110 billion people on earth. It's your partner who's your main witness as you go through life. So for 2017, is it going to be a new chapter, a new verse, or is it going to be the same old story? And whether you're talking about the proper diet and exercise routine, or transforming our character flaws and deep-seated bitterness and unforgiveness, Friends, this is that awkward place of self-denial and temptation where Christ's Spirit comes along and says, follow my inner voice. And you have a choice. You can stay the way you are or you can step into God's version of you. Well, friends, I've been talking about how to acquire wisdom. We also have God's power. I want you to understand that he can create a great new year for our lives. In fact, the power of God is the single most important advantage that we have. One gentleman said, I place no hope in my strength nor in my works, but all my confidence is in God, my protector, who never abandons those who have put all their hopes and thoughts in him. He promises to be faithful to you. You just need to stay close to God and you're going to succeed in this upcoming year. In fact, you can lay hold of everything God wants for you to have. So what might God want for you to have in the new year? Well, I know that he wants to be activated in your life. He wants you to know him, his grace that covers your life in all its entirety. But he also wants us to bear fruit for the kingdom. Again, the love of Christ controls us, which means every encounter that we have is seen through the lens of how would Jesus handle this situation, this person, this obstacle. And I know this, usually it's with grace and courage. That's how Jesus wants to live. A new relationship with Jesus, it brings about a new relationship with everybody that crosses your path. You know, we had this controversial <clears throat> presidential election, and one church member was wearing a, a button in support of their candidate. And so the pastor suggests, well, you ought to take that button off. And of course, the parishioner got defensive. Uh, I believe in what they stand for. The pastor said, yes, but what about somebody making a decision about Jesus from the other party's persuasion? 
Your pen could keep them from hearing the word of God and entering into a relationship with Jesus. The man took off the pen and said, I guess it's not about being a Democrat or a Republican, but about whether somebody's in a relationship with Jesus. And I think when we look at the people around us, we shouldn't be looking at their politics, their finances, their education, their race, their position in society. We need to be looking for the Jesus in them. And if it's not their work to establish Jesus in them. I will say this to my mature believers. God is hoping to activate some prayer warriors this year. He's hoping that some of us are going to follow him in his footsteps to fight against evil. Jesus fought evil with relentless ferocity, and he challenged the structures of injustice. You know, this past week, I was listening to a missionary from Mumbai, India. It's a hellhole of brutal exploitation with the sex trade. Uh, the stories are so radical that they're unfit for Sunday morning audience. And, and this one missionary, he was up against great odds in opposition. Everybody shut him out. They wanted nothing to do with anything he had to say. But one of the byproducts of, of the sex trade in, in Mumbai is girls, when they die from AIDS, they get tossed out into the street. He said, this is my window of opportunity. So he got a friend, and he would come to these women, and he would wrap them gently and respectfully in a cloth, and then take them and give them a proper burial. Well, the colleagues of these AIDS victims would see this taking place. And finally, one of them came up and said, I I've heard about you. Why do you give us dignity at this most painful moment in life? And he responded, because God has sent me to tell you that he loves you and he has a plan for your life. Do you know, in 2016, 2,000 women gave their lives to Jesus as the missionary cared for 350 of their children. You see, friends, he put his life into motion. He was met with lots of opposition, and he waited for that moment when the Holy Spirit said, this is how I want you to do it. And right now, thousands of people are meeting Jesus. You know, it makes you ask, is this world a better place because of my faith? It's an important question. It's easy to be in the routine of Christianity. I go to church, I read my Bible, I, I, I support the ministry. But, but, but is there any power being released through your faith? Because you and I, we're not going to be able to please God without faith. And, and friends, I'd like to suggest that we belong to a pretty amazing God. That if we step out in faith, is going to do incredible things. You know, Hall of Fame running back Emmett Smith, he commented, Hall of Famers think about the Hall of Fame. Pro Bowlers think about going to the Pro Bowl. Great players make great goals for themselves. And what about us? Spiritually, I think the same principles apply. Okay? It's not because, hey, I want to be great for God. No, it's because we have a clear understanding of how great is our God. This Lord that we serve, who reaps where he does not sow, who can accomplish anything he wants. And I'd like to suggest that we all set our personal goals according to the God we serve. Well, I told you about one violinist. I'm going to bring up another one. It was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer didn't want to waste too much time on this old violin. So he held it up and asked, who will start the bidding? One dollar, two, two dollars, three. Going once, going twice. Suddenly this old man with gray hair raised his hand, came forward, dusted off the violin, tightened up the strings. It began to play the most sweet and moving melody. Handed it back to the auctioneer. He says, who will bid on this? One thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars, going once, twice, sold. The people cheered, some folks cried. Everybody was confused, but one person said to the guy next to him, what just happened? What changed its worth from $2 to $3,000? The man next to him said, it was the touch of the master's hand. And I wonder how many of us have lives that are out of tune. 
You know, we've been battered by life. We've been scarred by sin. And we're pretty certain if we were to get auctioned off, we'd go cheap. But you know what? The master comes along and he defines your soul as something precious. If only this year we let the master's hand touch our lives. I want you to know he's called you for something special. Two years, excuse me, 2017. I know a lot of you don't make resolutions. Why? He'll tell me, they never work. I close. 1959, remember Ben-Hur in the famous chariot race scene? Required five weeks of filming, 1,500 extras, 18 chariots. And in the spirit of authenticity, Charlton Heston wanted to learn how to drive the chariot. And so after weeks of practice, he, he went up to the stunt <clears throat> director and said, listen, you know, I, I know how to drive this, but I don't know that I can win. The director said, you just make sure you stay in the chariot and I'll make sure you win. And I tell you this because this is what God is saying to us. Let's just stay close to him. And I'm sure you're going to win the race. Because that's the kind of God you belong to. Amen? Amen. This leads us to communion. When we receive the empowerment of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We brought sin into our lives and it devastated us. Jesus came along and said, I want you not to be devastated. I want you to be blessed and loved. And so he came to die the death that we should have died, lived the life we should have lived, and brought to us an unhindered access to the throne of mercy. Friends, let me tell you how communion works here in our church. You don't need to be a member of our church. You don't even need to be a Presbyterian. We merely ask that you embrace what Jesus did for you on the cross. And the invitation is from God to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, we usually start from the back rows. We come forward. We take the bread and we dip it into the cup. If you're worried about the bread, we have gluten-free wafers. If you're worried about the cup, it's unfermented wine, no problems. Our only request is if you drop your bread into the cup that you don't dig around for it, okay? Just reach back and get a fresh piece. But most importantly, as you're coming forward, I want you to pause and embrace what Jesus Christ has done for you. Well, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and first he blessed it and then he broke it saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also we took the cup. Gracious God, we thank you for this meal. Nurture our souls, cultivate our faith. Cause us to rise up as your people. Become prayer warriors and activate the power of God in our personal lives and release it upon everybody else. Your grace, your love, your joy, your peace. What amazing gifts that we have to give on behalf of you, our Lord and Savior. And Lord, as we begin the new year in your presence, answer prayers, heal our bodies, Fix our relationships. Go deep down into the middle of our souls and cause a new person to come forward and bring you glory like never before. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. And I invite you all now to stand and sing the prayer he taught us.
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you.